We here at Our Sports Are Virtual Major League Baseball. Our product provides an advanced and authentic experience in the hybrid category of fantasy and virtual sports. By owning and operating an our sports franchise, you compete for championships and money in leagues that mirror the MLB in every way. For sports fans who have dreamed of owning a sports franchise and handing out business cards that say Team Owner, Our Sports is making that dream a reality. Find them on Twitter at Our Sports Baseball and on Facebook as Our Sports Baseball. You're listening to NGSC Sports Radio. Hear us live on NGSCSports.com, where you can get awesome analysis for all things sport. Or check out our podcasts on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, and much more. For our latest videos, head to NGSC Sports' YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at NGSC Sports and like us on Facebook. NGSC Sports. We never stop. Okay, that's that'll be a good place to cut. Ah, oh, yeah. So that's why we're redoing this intro. Yeah, excitement abound here on a Ford Affair podcast episode, <laughs> and it's just like the old days. <laughs> we're saying shit. We have to edit it. Oh man. Oh god. Rick <laughs> Fox. Out of the podcast before. Rick Fox is you know still around and. and and he's invading my weekends now. It's very awkward how how that's come around. Well, uh, it's better than the way he was invaded. It's true. And, and another way going around. Welcome to the Foreign wow. Affair Podcast, episode 197. We can joke about that because it was fictional. I am Edward Green, joined as always by my call crime, Wes Bradshaw. Wes, happy Valentine's Day, my friend. Oh, happy Valentine's to you as well, Ed. Love you, friend. Oh, I love you too, Wes. And as we start... All this love in with love for our teams as we get into a great Premier League recap as well as a Champions League review. Both of us excitingly happy for two different results that that couldn't have been more different, Um, but still the same levels of joy abound. Uh, We'll have a quick FA Cup preview on this episode as well as some news and notes. Hey, there was that U.S. soccer president meeting, voting thing, and it was a thing. So we'll get to that, uh, as well as the Watch 4 and So Raw. As always, the podcast is presented by NGSC Sports, NGSCSports.com. We never stop. As well as our sports baseball, with pitchers and catchers reporting for most teams. That baseball is getting real, but so is fantasy baseball. Don't just play fantasy sports. Own a team and get equity. Just like whatever Steinbrenner owns the Yankees now. I don't know there's like 80 of them so. steinbrenner children Ugh, one of them does but that's fine go to our sports baseball and get be a better than a steinbrenner today don't fire brian not that hard. no 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 it's really not all right wes straight to the football then oh my goodness indeed that that is exactly what i am thinking of first to the matches we're not going to talk much about uh everton Beats Palace 3-1. Everton continuing to improve that they can beat teams that are not in the top 10. Uh, West Ham beats Watford 2-0 at the Olympic Stadium. Uh, Chicharito Hernandez with another goal, as well as Marco Arnautovic. Uh, Stoke draws Brighton 1-1. Jose Izquierdo with the opening salvo for Albion. But Zerdin Shakiri just 34 minutes later, canceled it out at the bet 365 to earn Stoke a much-needed point. Swansea back to winning ways as they beat Burnley. 1 0. So, Key, oh, using his, ch- uh, what is it? How do you actually, is that, ah, oh, I forgot what K I actually is. There's a, that's a Chi? Is it Chi? Maybe it's Chi. I might be wrong on that. I don't really care. He had the, he had the goal for them. <laughs> Swansea wins 1 0. Um, Man City keeps going. Sergio Aguero decided to join the Golden Boot Race in the Premier League. Not that, you know, we wanted him to because, you know, we, we got it covered, Serge. 
Don't worry about it. Uh, 5-1 is the score for Man City over Leicester. Aguero with four goals in that match. Um, as City just keeps winning. But hey, maybe there's still a title race or something. Huddersfield beats Bournemouth 4-1 on Sunday. Um, big win for Huddersfield and David Wagner's men. Uh, Newcastle gets a big... You know what? We'll get... We'll, uh... No, yeah. Okay, we'll start with this one. We'll start with this one. Yeah. Newcastle United gets a big Matt Ritchie goal. His first goal in, I believe, 43 shots this Premier League season. The longest route of the Premier League comes to a close against Manchester United. 1-0 is the victory. And obviously afterwards, the fallout, of course, comes from Manchester United. Oh, no, they're, they're playing that unattractive football again. Oh no, Paul Pogba doesn't like what position he's playing and wants Mourinho to change formation if you trust Duncan Castles. Oh, there's all that. Wes, once again, United just kind of come up short on the road and that's when you don't have a strong offensive impetus. It feels like this can happen, especially against very desperate uh, home sides in the Premier League. Well, exactly. You know, Mourinho just has this thought train where, you know, I can just, you know, how we say here in the U.S., you know, I can roll my helmet out there and people are going to be, oh, God, no, it's United. Mm -hmm. um, Not with Rafa and, Benitez on the other side. Well, and, and that is one thing, you know, you have a guy in Rafa who has, you know, people call uh, Mourinho the pragmatist. <laughs> um <laughs> Sometimes Rafa's pragmatism puts Mourinho to shame. It's true. <laughs> hey, Ed, you know, when he was at Liverpool, we had one of the best defenses in England. <laughs> no figure. So, um, but for Mourinho, I, 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 don't, I don't get it. I, I just I don't understand the tactics. You know, I can understand if he was maybe sitting back waiting to hit on a counter, but it's like they don't even do that worth of crap. Mm -hmm. And here you are, you know, you just – Mourinho is like a guy who has a garage full of Ferraris, and it's like he, he wants to drive down, you know, a one-way street in Rocky Mountain going 25 with the potholes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, whatever you think about Pogba, Pogba is a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Lukaku, uh, Martial, these guys are Ferraris. And, of course, you just, you just bought Alexis Sanchez. Yeah. Ferrari, sir. I understand you might have a couple of Pintos in the back and small and Jones. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, De Gea is like, well, it's De Gea. De Gea is like a bit less. <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, all this, all this attacking power, and he, Mourinho wants to whine about them. They don't spend money. They don't give me anything. Oh, shit. They bought and bought and bought. And they bought him these players that he claims this is what he needs to be able to win and yet he still wants to play like he's a relegation fighting club mm -hmm. and that's just that's the style that they're playing is i mean you know they're playing the kind of football you would figure newcastle would be playing yeah um and uh, you know the big controversy the bigger fallout they're not even talking about else anymore it's all about pogba right now yeah, and I think Pogba's been subbed out of three straight matches. I I want to um, say like I I believe I read, and I might get this wrong, so I'm actually going to try to pull up the article again. I want to say I read that he's never actually finished a Premier League game since he came back to United. That can't be true, but I feel like I read that. that doesn't sound right. That doesn't literally sound right at all. But no. I'll try. But I'll, you know, I'll look, I'll I, I know I've heard. I've heard the last three matches he's been substituted and has not been happy about it. Um, okay, so just real then, quick, the article does say the Old Trafford manager has not used Pogba for a full ninety minutes since the forwards' arrival, substituting the Frenchman in losses at Tottenham, Tottenham and Newcastle, and dropping him for the home win over Huddersfield. So I, I, I can't believe that stat is true. But wait, I, wait, wait, wait! You said since the forwards arrived, do you, do you maybe mean ooh. since Sanchez is around? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, okay. that's what happens you. when you skim through an article. You don't remember. There you go. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Fair enough. And, and that's, that sounds about right. That's Fair three enough. straight matches. So. Yeah. yeah. Um. 
And, you know, really, since Sanchez came, and of course, Sanchez is a great player. We know that. Yeah. Um, but since he's come, it's been almost to the detriment of Pogba because for some reason now Mourinho believes, well, now that I've got him, I have to play Pogba deep. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand why that feeling is. I mean, you, a team, especially a team like Newcastle, you're going to dominate possession. You're man united. Mm-hmm. Why do you have to send Pogba deep the whole time? Let him make runs. Let him do what he does. That made him a ninety million pound record player at the time, or British record, whatever it was. Let him be him. Now, I mean, I'm no fan of Paul Pogba. We know this. Uh, Pogba's struggles make me giggle at times. Same here. But you know, I mean. Let's put it this way. Is Jurgen Klopp putting Mo Salah as a deep holding midfielder? No. Wouldn't that kind of defeat the purpose of what Mo Salah does? A little bit. <laughs> you know, are we putting uh you know, are, are we putting Mane as a central defender? No. No. Nope. Yeah, just why have you got these guys if you don't want to do what you're supposed to do with them? That's the thing to me. Uh, but now the thing is, it's starting to get some real media play. At first, it was just speculation. Oh, there might be something. Well, now it's come out really in the last few hours. You know, Pogba's made a statement um, saying, you know, he he's not happy where he's playing right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what what's going to be really something to watch here is you've got a guy who basically is the British record signing and and is arguably the maybe not the top media personality player on the world, but very close to it. You know, mm-hmm. obviously you got Ronaldo and Messi. I think Pogba after Ronaldo and Messi, I mean Pogba right, but Pogba's right there. Should be, yeah. Um, you've got him, the guy that you basically put as the future of the franchise, and then you've got the manager who you just gave an extension to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's that's something else. I mean, that extension just got signed in the last few weeks. And this is Mourinho who, you know, was maybe seen as sort of jerking United around about a contract extension. And, you know, there was a lot to that. They, then they made a big deal that they re-signed him. And now as soon as they re-sign him, he's going to war with the top player. Yeah. So, so weird. I mean, this has... <laughs> This has the makings of being a crazy, crazy media story going forward. I mean, it really does. It, it has, I mean, something's got to give. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, we know Mourinho. And Mourinho's not one who's going to give. Right. And, I mean, do you risk alienating your best player, the guy, a 24-year-old? I mean, 24, man. Pogba, yeah, I think we kind of think, well, Pogba's been around forever. It's just because, you know, Pogba's kind of like LeBron James. I mean, we sit there, God, LeBron James has been around for like 20 years and he's only 32. <laughs> it's like, Jesus, God, this guy's still got years ahead of him. Pogba's got many years ahead of him. He broke in early. He's a superstar. Um, I mean, are you, as Mourinho, prepared to basically go to war and and potentially have your best player maybe mutiny on you. Yeah. I mean, could this lead to I mean, if they can't get something straight, it almost feels like something's got to give, as in somebody would have to go. <coughs> so, I think right right now, I don't think that's on the really. Yeah, but unless they can figure something out, but yeah, I can see guys like Pogba, Lukaku, um, maybe Sanchez going forward. You know, the great thing. Well, here's the draw to Man United: a the money. Mm-hmm. United's willing to pay massive amounts of money for players, certainly, and and they will pay the high salaries. You know, b the media exposure is insane at United. You know, if you want to be a superstar, you go to Man United to be a superstar. Um, and, and then see, you know, United is so well known. And we talked about this when Moyes was there, when Van Hall was there. United are so well known as being this 
fluid attacking side. And that's something that's always been really attractive. I mean, do guys really want to go to United to, as we've talked about, park the bus? Mm -hmm. And you're kind of seeing right now, I mean, if you can't figure out how to fit, let's put it this way, strip the ego, give Jurgen Klopp Paul Pogba. Mm -hmm. Give Mauricio Pochettino Paul Pogba. Mm -hmm. Give Pep Guardiola Paul Pogba. Oh, God. Well, what the hell do you think is going to happen? The guy's going to be a – I mean, he's going to be potentially the best player in the league overnight. You give him to Mourinho, and it's almost like Mourinho's sitting there like, well, you know what? I know how great you can be, but you know what? You're going to do things my way because I'm the great Mourinho. Now, does does Pogba maybe have to take some of the blame here? Because one of the reasons Mourinho gave for subbing him off in a sort of roundabout Josie Mm -hmm. way was his – poor clearance or or lack thereof led directly to Matt Ritchie's goal. And we do know Pogba's never been the best defender. And he even mentioned in his press conference the talk about Pogba being a box-to-box defender where Pogba maybe doesn't like to go box-to-box unless it's from the 6-18 to yard box. I mean, this is this is an issue if this is the kind of guy you want to pl- the kind mm-hmm. of player you want to be especially in a Mourinho system where defense is yep. so important. Now, I'm not I'm not saying I completely agree with Josie either. I think he has mismanaged Pogba to, to a certain mm-hmm. extent. But I do think Pogba does shoulder some of the blame. He is a spectacular talent, physically mm-hmm. gifted, offensively proficient, but it, it just seems like he maybe doesn't want to put in the work defensively on a consistent basis and and I can see where from somebody like Mourinho now to be oh, again against Mourinho for a second if you're going against Newcastle even on the road you should still be going balls to the walls with that team like that's that's silly but if, if you're set if that's the expectation that that's how you want to play then you have to play like that and you have to get better and Pogba isn't getting better in that sense no, but I think at the same time, Pogba, Mourinho might see him as a box-to-box midfielder. Mm-hmm. I think Pogba, <clears throat> excuse me, I think Pogba sees himself as an... Mm-hmm. I don't think Pogba sees himself as coming from, you know, a, a, four two, a four two three one from coming from the two, mm-hmm. um, from coming from that part of the field. I think Pogba sees himself as a number 10 or as a forward playing, a more forward playing midfielder. Right. Like, um, a, like a Christian Erickson yeah. type sort of. Yeah. More like an Erickson or, you know, like a Coutinho played when he sure. was at Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he sees himself more as that type of a player. And I can see where that's frustrating for the manager, because when you look at it, you're like, oh, God, I have like this prototype central midfielder who, I mean, I mean, let's put it this way. You know, it, the guy has the tools to be Steven Gerrard. Mm-hmm. Agreed. But he has nowhere near the mentality of, I want to do the dirty to be like a Steven Gerrard now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Pogba wakes up every day, oh, I want to be Steven G. Mm-hmm. You know, but sure. <laughs> just that kind of a player, you know, a guy who – who can be absolutely spectacular going forward, a guy who can play the, you know, the gorgeous, the the Hollywood pass, as Mm -hmm. they used to say, Stevie played the Hollywood passes, Um, you know, or the guy who can go forward and score, you know, Gerard was a guy who scored double digit goals every season as a midfielder. Mm -hmm. Of course, part of that was because he was also the primary penalty taker, but still, you know, this is a guy who scored a lot from open play, Mm -hmm. you know, scored goals. Pogba has not put up those type of numbers at all mm-hmm. as a goal scorer, as someone going forward. But also Steven Gerrard was a guy who, you know, when, when he had to go do some dirty work and put in a good hard English tackle, <laughs> Stevie had English tackle in him all day and Stevie would get dirty and nasty. Mm-hmm. Pogba doesn't have that. Pogba may have the skill set to do everything that Steven Gerrard did, but he doesn't have the mentality of someone like a Steven Gerrard. Do you think, now, a, a little bit, do you think maybe that comes from Gerrard, and I, if I'm getting this wrong, please correct me, but I do believe Gerrard spent his entire playing career in the Premier League, right? 
Uh, that's yes. I mean, he was a one club man, so he went to Galaxy. Right. Um, so, so his, the the important parts of his career was always in the Premier League. With Pogba Absolutely. going to Serie A and spending what was his really formative years, because really his time at the first time at United doesn't really count that much. His formative years being in a different league with Serie A and being on by far and away the best team in Juventus in his time there. Mm-hmm. Does that maybe affect his growth at all? And that some of his um, is not talent or abilities, but some of his, you know, you know, the the basic building blocks. What am I? The fundamentals. That's what I'm going for. The fundamentals. Maybe those atrophied a little bit on the defensive end while playing for Juventus through no fault of theirs, but just it was a different style, a different league, a different everything, really. Yeah, and I mean, that has something to do with that. Obviously, this is Pogba who came through the United system. That's fair. That That is true. So, I mean, it's not like it's not like coming to England was this massive culture shock. Like, oh, God, I didn't know it was going to be cold and raining here. <laughs> you know, Pogba, Pogba grew up at United. Yes. That, and then left fair. when he was, I think, 17 or 18 and went to Juventus, was there for three or four years. Yeah, and then came back. But, you know, this shouldn't be culture shock to him. And the thing is, what we've seen, when Pogba has been put in the right positions and when Pogba switched on, Mm-hmm. Dude, he's he's great. He's great. I mean, you know, we saw it at times last year, especially. He could absolutely take over a match and, you know, just run it, boss it, do whatever he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But once again, I think a lot of it just comes down to mentality for him that, you know, I've, I've made fun of Pogba relentlessly because I love it. Mm-hmm. The hair. Yeah. The emoji, <laughs> the commercials, you know, the 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 social media presence. <clears throat> you know what? That stuff is well and good when you can switch on as soon as you step on the pitch. Case in point, I'm watching him right now. I'm watching the mm-hmm. sheet of that. Number seven, CR7, the original brand. Mm-hmm. Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo, basically, basically whatever Paul Pogba's doing, Cristiano Ronaldo's been there to mm-hmm. the t-shirt. But what happens when Ronaldo steps on the field? Now, obviously, this year, is he's had issues this year. I think part of that's age catching up to him. Mm-hmm. But for years, Ronaldo has stepped on the pitch. As soon as he stepped on the pitch, okay, this is business. You know, Now, yeah, when I go score that goal, I want to make sure they see my face <laughs> and how glorious my hair looks. But the thing for Ronaldo was it always came down to I've got to do my job before I can look good because, you know what, looking good's part of it. But doing my job is the reason that everybody loves me or or on the other side hates me. Yeah. But that's the reason I'm the biggest star in the world is because I do my job. And Pogba just does not have that killer instinct that a Ronaldo, that a Messi, that – um you know, those kind of guys have even, even David Beckham, you know, when David Beckham was Mm -hmm. Ronaldo before Ronaldo was Ronaldo, (laughs) you know, I mean, David Beckham was in the magazines, David Beckham's spectacular hair. still. Mm -hmm. Calvin Klein model. Oh my God. He's a gorgeous man. Uh, I mean, he was everywhere. He was everything. Beckham, when he stepped on the field, it was okay. I've got man United business to handle today. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Pogba just does it, it does not it has not clipped like that for Pogba mm-hmm. now I will say God, I think he's only I think he's 24 let me look I think that sounds right but let me I check. think so it's a bet it's time right now for it to be clicking for Pogba yeah, 24 25 in a month you know okay you're no longer the starlet who has all the potential mm-hmm 24, 25 years old. This is when you should be hitting your peak as a player. Um, you know, Pogba's entering his prime. It's time to get over this whole, I play when I want, and then I sulk. That shit ain't going to cut it. If he wants to truly be the world-class player that he should be, he, he's he got to get away from that. He's got to grow up. Um, and it's getting a little late right now. You know, and... The thing is, he's got he's got the talent to be 
in the Ronaldo Messi, um, the Ronaldo Messi category. He's got that talent, but you know, right now he doesn't have the mentality. You know who does have the mentality? Who's Harry that? Kane has the mentality. It's true. Mohamed Salah looks like he has mm. the mentality. Yeah. Yep. Neymar. He look, look at Neymar for all the shit that Neymar gets. When Neymar gets on the field, Neymar's ready to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's what you've got to do to become one of those elite world players. And not just a guy who, oh man, he's so talented. God, did you see the fancy flakes he did on that Adidas commercial? Mm-hmm. Wow, he looks really cool when he does the Nike ads. You know, for Pogba, I think Pogba's getting very close to the point put up or shut up. Mm-hmm. And I will say, if he doesn't figure something out before the end of the season, United's going to go into the summer trying to figure out, you know, who who do, who do we put our trust in? Mm-hmm. Is our trust in the player or is our trust in the manager who we just re-signed from England? Mm-hmm. So I think there's a decision coming. And uh, one way or the other, I think there could be a shocker one way or the other. Mm-hmm. But if Paul Pogba left United, I think United fans would just be floored. I think a lot of fans around the world would just yeah. be floored. I think we would be floored, given how this transfer happened. I think it'd be to, to almost just kind of blow it up yeah. within within and, this short time period. Now, that said, one thing for United, the way the market, even with Pogba having the they would double their money on Pogba. Oh, to any one of the other four leagues. Absolutely. Yeah. At 25 years old, yeah. they would double their money selling them to Spain. They should sell them to Spain. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, well, here's the thing. If, <laughs> or PSC. I, well, and that's what I was going to say, because we're not going to go down this road too far. But, I mean, if if those crazy rumors are true and Neymar leaves PSG at the end of this year and goes to Real Madrid, and PSG needs another big name, Pogba's not a bad option. And he'll be uh-huh. fine. He'll be fine. He'll be fine with the way he plays at PSG. So yeah, because you know that's the thing coming from Italy. You get up for three or four matches a year. It's kind of like playing in Spain. Now, Italy, I think Italy, Italy has gotten more competitive mm-hmm. this year, especially. I mean, this year Italy, you better be switched on. True. Um, but thus far, Pogba has shown that he might be a little more at home, say in a, a Spanish situation, a, a German situation, a French situation, where. He doesn't have to switch on, and I've got. I, I would fully expect that if he ended up at one of those, I bet he if he ended up at Barcelona, mm-hmm. oh, you know he'd be ready to go when El Clasico came around. Mm-hmm. You know he'd be ready to go, and yeah, just things like that. But uh, there, there's an there's an underlying issue at United, and we're gonna see if it's gonna if it's going to fix itself or if it could blow up. I wouldn't say totally blow up the mm-hmm. experiment, but because the thing is, you know, if United sold them for big money, they would go out and replace it. Sure. They would spend big money to bring somebody in, and you know that. United would do it. Absolutely. Um, you almost wonder if it might be, kind of like we've talked about, you know, addition by subtraction. Maybe. So, you know, get rid of the, get rid of the, get rid of the cancer and, you know, save everything else. Yeah, it's it's going to be tough in the uh, the off season, especially depending on how the uh, the rest of the, their cup runs, being the FA Cup as well as the Champions League, and and just if they can maintain second place in the Premier League, that isn't looking as stable as it was a few weeks ago. So we're going to have to see how their their results finish at the end of the season with uh, who sticks around. Uh, speaking of shaky ground, but hey, I guess everything's fine now. Chelsea beats West Brom three nil on Monday. Uh, Ed Nazard gets a brace. Everything's fine, I guess. It's fine at Chelsea. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, I guess if you want to believe that. For uh, now. They, For they, now. They, they, beat, they beat who again? West Brom. Exactly. And by the way, that's a West Brom who lost Sturridge in the first two minutes. Yep. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, we'll just yeah, we'll just leave that at that. Oh, no. Stur- Sturridge came on, had one touch, came up lame. And they won the didn't trust him to stick around and debut. <laughs> hmm. Well, at least you can sub on Jay Rodriguez. He's always sure to be healthy. As we move on to uh, <laughs> to another match, um, let's go to let's go to the NLD. Let's go to the match that started off the entire weekend. North London Derby, 
the Wembley edition for this season. Tottenham won, Arsenal nil. No other man could have scored this match but Harry Kane, who had his Vince Carter dunk moment on Arsenal's defense as he skied higher than the rest <laughs> to bury a 49th minute header from Kieran Trippier's cross to give Tottenham the big 1 0 victory over their North London rivals. A very important win for them, ending their three Premier League match crucible streak. That sees them get seven points out of nine, with the other matches coming against United and Liverpool. Um, Tottenham, as we like to say, Wes, could have had five. They did have to dodge a scary moment at the end uh, from Alexander Lacazette. Two golden chances, um, and those gold uh, would turn his legs to gold, it seems, because he's going to miss the next four to six weeks with knee surgery. So, Wes, there's two sides to this game. One, obviously, Tottenham. Just another very good performance, except for those final few minutes, were never really bothered all game by Arsenal. Um, I believe Hugo Lloris had to make one stop on a Jack Wilshere save, and that was really about it for Arsenal. Um, but then for I, I do kind of want to get into this Alexander Lacazette becoming the new Mishibachi, uh for Arsenal instead of Chelsea. So, But first, let's praise Tottenham for what was another great performance. And as we'll get to the Champions League game too, in a little bit, a string of really good showings. Absolutely. Um, you know, get, give it up for Arsenal. They win it. Or, or some shit on Arsenal. I give it up for... And they... They were the favorite. Mm -hmm. And that's not always... That's not always a great thing for Tottenham to be the favorite. Tottenham seem like they do their best work when everybody doubts them. Mm -hmm. um, see midweek. Yeah. <laughs> see midweek, yes. Um, and, you know, a few years ago, I believe, I think it was two years ago, the the demise of Arsenal was supposed to be Tottenham's year. Well, it was the year, um, oh, it was the year Leicester won the league. Yes. You know, it was finally going to be the year, you know, was going to finish above Arsenal. Everything was coming up Tottenham, and then bad things happened down the stretch, and they still finished behind mm -hmm. Arsenal. Mm -hmm. Last year, they got that monkey off their back. For whatever people think of St. Totteringham's Day, I think it was somewhat of a mental block mm -hmm. against Tottenham, because now you've seen that since getting that off their back, they're a better team, they know they're a better team, and they've mostly showed they're a better team. Now, what happened at the Emirates back uh, earlier in the season, mm -hmm. ugh, ugh. <laughs> it was just a bad day. But, you know, here it was, a chance for Tottenham to put distance between themselves and Arsenal in the battle for fourth, in the battle for a Champions League spot. Um, they go in, they they have opportunities they, that they're not bearing, but but their best player, Harry Kane, is able to come in take an opportunity he gets, he finishes. And basically for Tottenham, that's exactly what they needed. Their best player mm -hmm. coming up big when it mattered most. And they come out with a big victory. It does put a nice cushion between them and sixth place. Arsenal, right now, it looks like the Premier League is three spots among four teams up mm -hmm. for grabs. Uh, because that looks like it may have kind of put Arsenal to bed for the season. And, and Arsenal could go and win some matches. But the problem is they've got to catch two teams. They're going to have to catch. Yeah, they're going to have to get past two now. And, you know, well, I guess really they only had to get past one. But uh, no, they don't to, think they'd have to, well, get they'd have to get. They're in six. Oh, that's right. That's right. They're in six. Yeah, they go. Well, they'd have to get. Past, yeah, OK. They have to get past two. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think Liverpool and Tottenham are coming back to the pack any. Mm -hmm. And Chelsea. Gee, Chelsea might end up being an odd team out this year anyway. I just I don't see Liverpool and Tottenham coming back to the and I don't even unless see uh, unless unless they both have some major league injuries or some major mm -hmm. league injuries. I also don't see Chelsea falling hard enough. I could see them falling out of the top four. Mm -hmm. I don't see them falling hard enough and Arsenal catching them both happening. I agree. I agree. So it, it, it's it's looking like another lost year, maybe for the Gunners. Still got Europa. Mm -hmm. um, Still have the League yeah, Cup final. The, 
Well, I'll tell you, yeah, I still got that. Uh, but I mean, as far as Champions League, um, you know, Europa does matter now. Mm-hmm. You know, we've seen the last sure. few years, you know, Sevilla's found their way in. United have obviously kind of become the poster boy of ones who have won their way in and done something. Mm-hmm. You know, Sevilla was always, oh, we got in. And now we, <laughs> now we just, uh, we, we get knocked out in the, we get knocked out and go back to Europa. But United have shown you can win Europa, you can get into the Champions League, you can make that make that move, make some runs, and it does help. Mm-hmm. Um, that's it. It's going to take some real mental fortitude for to- for Arsenal to do that. Mm-hmm. They're not really known for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but huge huge win on the day for Tottenham. I, I love it for the mentality. You know, they come off the really. I mean, you, you look at the stretch they just went through. Mm-hmm. To get seven points from United, Liverpool, and Arsenal. Yeah, with Liverpool on the road. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. I I I don't think they I don't think they could have asked for. It. No, not really. Uh, I mean, if if anyone had said three weeks ago, "Hey, Tottenham, seven points, two wins and a draw." Oh hell yeah! And <laughs> plus, not that it maybe played that big of a deal, but they did have to throw an FA Cup replay in there as well. Hey, you were there. It, it was there. It was a match. Yeah. Had to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you know, big, uh, big win for Tottenham, and I, I think it's one that's going to keep them propelling forward. As we see, you know, they may have had a little hangover, after yeah. uh, but you know, once again, we saw that mentality. We've seen the mentality really from Tottenham over the last three weeks. You know, they've been down or they haven't been at their best, and they keep getting results. I do want to say, and and I I was going to talk about this more once we got to the, their Champions League fixture. I, I'm uh-huh. going to talk to you about it now anyway. Um, we talked a lot about the transfer window, and and Tottenham's only move really was signing Lucas Mora from PSG, who did make his debut today in the Champions League match. Um, but they got back Eric Lamella, who is looking better by the week, and is looking like where they don't just have to play Kane. And then Erickson Ali's son. They have a, a replacement for Son or Ali or whoever. They and have also bring uh, Lucas Mora making uh, debut this week. Exactly. They have him. Victor Wanyama as I play. I think played one match before Christmas and is mm-hmm. now being reintegrated into what is now a strong looking midfield again. Musa Dembele, who we'll get to it against Juventus, was amazing. Against Arsenal, was amazing. Mm-hmm. He looks healthy again. You know, yep. Danny Rose, if if he can get reintegrated a little bit, that's another win. Toby Alderweireld, he's getting reintegrated. They didn't make a whole lot of moves in the January transfer window, but they're getting a lot of players back. And if they can keep those guys back and healthy for this stretch run, those are big upgrades. This is a Tottenham, Tottenham. team that was already really good and is adding really good players back from injury. This is this is a scary team, I think. I'm not saying they're going to catch City. I don't even know uh, that they're going to finish like second. But I don't I, think anybody can catch City at this point. Yeah, but I, I do think yeah. this is a team now all of a sudden that if they can get past Juventus, this is a team that maybe can keep making noise in the Champions League, maybe makes a, a deep, maybe even winning FA Cup run, and maybe makes a push to finish top three in the league, which would be another very solid season. So this is this is Tottenham maybe starting to round into uh, into their peak form, which is what we say when when do you want to start rounding into form? Right about nowish. Yes, yeah. I mean especially when you're in the Champions League, mm-hmm. you're in the race for the league. Yeah, I mean this is the time you want to start playing your best, and and Tottenham have what many many fans. Dream. Yeah, it depends on what they're. Mm. Well, he he's coming back from injury. He's just like a new signing. Yes. Damn it, I'd rather have the signing. But no, you know, when you've got guys, like we've talked about Tottenham, bring him back from injury. I mean, those, those are the guys that, you know, they're going to provide the depth. They're going to provide that extra. Who is the Toby uh, Alderweireld you're signing in the January transfer market? Literally other than Virgil van Dijk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. Which we signed. <laughs> that's literally it. That's the only one. Nobody else is going to do it. So there you go. Um, and, and real quick, you brought sure. up the name Toby Oliver. Um, he's making his way back. I mean, he played against Juventus, right? He did not, actually. He did not even he travel. Did not, okay. He did not travel. Okay, okay. But they're saying he's very close. 
Yeah. Well, he's he did play. He played the full ninety in their that's FA right. Cup he, match. Yes. That's right. That's right. So he is back. He he's mm-hmm. back. They're just they're they're kind of taking their time with him to make sure he's back. Today. Yes, and I um, I would wholeheartedly imagine he will be playing in the FA Cup match again this weekend, and and then be reintegrated into actual Premier League matches as well. Right, and that that's big for him getting yeah. a guy back like out of. That's really that's huge. I mean, he is one of the absolute top center defenders in the Premier League. Yeah, so that is that is a big get. But you spoke of Virgil Van Dyke powering now as as we talk about in these last four days what has been a powerhouse liverpool (laughs) defense two straight clean sheets let's talk about the first one right now and what could have been if we you know maybe a bit of a banana peel game we thought about that at swansea you thought jokingly i thought seriously (laughs) we saw that turned out this one also could have been one but uh no it was just more of a homecoming for liverpool as they win two nothing on the south coast of southampton uh roberto <laughs> firmino and mo salah with another premier league goal uh taking him to tied or sorry mm-hmm. still one behind harry kane because mm-hmm. kane also scored on the weekend um right. so salah still in I think, second I think kane's at 23 and salah's at 22 i believe i believe you're correct sir um so salah does get that second goal uh liverpool beat southampton 2-0 and, and the way I, I, when I was kind of watching it, and the way it was described kind of jives with that, Liverpool played really bad in the first half and went up into the half 2-0. They played really <laughs> good in the second half and didn't score. So, <laughs> great, good overall match for Liverpool, I guess. Just just the way Klopp drove it up. Exactly. Um, and just to add on to, you know, House Liverpool defense, um, really two back-to-back clean sheets now this week. Um, and really a Wanyama wonder strike. And once again, however we want to uh, <laughs> class the penalty call. Um, but that close to four consecutive clean sheets. Um, folks, Loris Karras, it might just work. He's a, He's been Jesus okay. Christ. It might just work. He was good in the Tottenham match. He was good here. He was good in the, on, yeah. the, on the midweek. Yeah, he's been he's been good. Yeah, um, he's been good. You know, some of his some of his style things yeah. in, on a personal basis we we may have issues with. Apparently, he's I don't know if you heard this. Ed. Apparently, he's friends with Justin Bieber. Uh, that explains which, yeah, the that man. Kind of, yeah, that kind of that, apparently they did a they did an episode mm. Of ribs mm. at, at his house and it was. Ooh. Little, little cringeworthy. But, hey, son, you keep keeping those clean sheets. I'll sing, baby, baby, baby. Oh. Oh. We'll play it over the loudspeakers at Liverpool if he keeps uh, keeping those clean sheets. Um, but, you know, personally, I think Klopp has found his center bat partnership for the season. Um, I think Lovren and Van Dyke are the best combo that we have. Um, everyone kind of thought it would be mad at in Van Dyke, mm-hmm. but Lovren, if you've watched Lovren over the years, mm-hmm. Lovren is like a blood and guts defender. Mm-hmm. Lovren loves charging in with a head of steam and playing extremely emotionally. Um, Just stay on your feet. He can, he can do that with Van Dyke behind him. True. Because he can now, he can take chances because he's got a feeling Hey, you know my partner can cover me if I, if I fuck up too bad here. My mm-hmm. partner can cover me, mm-hmm. which in the past that has not been the the Very point. Very true. Very true. Um, Van Dyke <laughs> early, especially everybody was looking for every reason to talk about how it was such a bullshit fee that Liverpool paid and oh we so overpaid and Liverpool are idiots. Van Dyke's been fantastic, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> every header that every ball that goes into now. It seems like Van Dyke's going to win the header. Yeah. Um, he's he's so good in possession. He he moves the ball intelligently. He doesn't lunge and go crazy and just lose his head like some of our <laughs> um, other defenders. To me, he's he's already he's already paying off the fee to me. I mean, I think he's just been spectacular, and he's only getting better. And also, like Klopp said, you're not going to see the best of Van Dyke till season until we have a full off season with him. Mm-hmm. And guess what? The Dutch are not the World Cup. 
So Van Dyke is going to have his holiday, and then he is going to spend the entire preseason with Jurgen Klopp, mm-hmm. uh, which is perfect. Um, but he he's been worth it. And as you've seen Van Dyke solidify that back, mm-hmm. everything's starting to work even more for it. Obviously, the attack is. I mean, nothing's <laughs> nothing's out of whack there, especially after the Champions League match that we'll talk about. But it's Salah. It's Salah and Firmino carrying the score. And they're doing it. They're relishing it. Um, <clears throat> both with uh, over 20 goals this season. Um, in all, Salah's over 30. Uh, they're playing fantastic. Jordan Henderson... Jordan Henderson, Jesus Christ, you know, every time we want to write off Jordan Henderson and tell him he's, mm-hmm. that's when suddenly he comes back and plays really well. He's playing well. James Milner's playing well. Um, you know, we found a left back in Andrew Robertson. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to stay there long term, but Trent Alexander Arnold has been a revelation at right back. Mm-hmm. I mean, this Liverpool team, they are. They seem like they're getting more dangerous by the week. Mm-hmm. And that's frightening because of the numbers they've already put this year. You know, second all time in the qualifying stages of the Champions League in the in the group stage, second all time for number of goals scored. Um, you know, they're right up there, they're putting goals in there like like gangbusters in the Premier League. Coutinho's gone. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's just at this point. Eh. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Not the end of the world, and it hasn't been the end of the world. Liverpool is just looking really good. And as for the Southampton match, it because they weren't sharp in the first half, they weren't playing well, and they got two goals. In the second half, we probably should have had two or three. Mm-hmm. You know, and we could have scored. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes things just don't go. They don't fall. But you know, really, when you think about St. Mary's, has been a tough place for us in the oh, past yeah, few years. Absolutely, that's why we keep getting their players because we knew once we <laughs> once we finally get the right ones, things are going to work out. For us. <laughs> uh, and, and apparently, it was um, it was Van Dyke. Was there. there you go. Uh, but I mean, you look at last year. We played we played Southampton four times last season. It didn't score a goal. Oof. And this season, we beat them five 0 over two. Mm-hmm. And they never really looked like they threatened us at all. Yeah. Um, it was a nasty day down on the South Coast. They, and I can't say I blame Southampton fans, but they kind of, they've gotten to a point, they get their jollies off of players that come from Liverpool. <laughs> um, and they had it for Van Dyke. They had it for, uh, you know, they, they boot the shit out of Van Dyke, but who they really don't like is <laughs> Lovren is like the the he's the one when it comes to booing the shit out of their former player. I hate Lovren, uh, and it almost seemed like uh, it almost it almost seemed like Klopp put Lovren on with about three minutes left just to fuck with him, <laughs> just so he could get a little run out. Um, but yeah, you know, all in all, I mean, good day for Liverpool. They won. Uh, United lost uh, as. Van Dyke said in his post match uh, interview, huh, unlucky. <laughs> he, he's channeled the great Lucas Leva with a. Unlucky. Unlucky. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we love unlucky. That's our thing at Liverpool. Uh, so, I mean, hey, what what better can you ask for right now? We're still two behind United. Um, still have a still have a head to head with United coming up. So, oh, fantastic. That's all you can ask. And don't forget also in that stretch, United still have to play City as well. So. Yes, they do. They're also going to have to play Chelsea, which is going to be in the next match of games. Uh, this Not this coming weekend, because it's an FA Cup weekend. Yay. Uh, but the weekend after, uh, you will have such matches to look forward to as Leicester versus, or sorry, Liverpool versus West Ham, uh, Tottenham versus Crystal Palace, and on that Sunday, the only game of the day, will be United versus Chelsea at Old Trafford. And something interesting, Wes, I do believe... That is the League Cup final weekend of, of the uh, the 24th, 25th, 26th, which is, I believe, between Arsenal and Man City, correct? Um, I believe so. Yes, yes, Arsenal Man City. So, fun story about that. Guess who's playing on Thursday, March 1st, just four days later? Tell me. It's Arsenal versus Man City. Oh, yeah. 
Ah, oh, scheduling gods, you beauts. You're wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. So that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. Um, but that is, again, a week away. As we look to the table, uh, City is still ahead now by doing the quick maths. 16 over United in second place. Uh, United are two up on Liverpool in third place. Uh, three up on Chelsea in fourth. And four points up on Tottenham in fifth. It is... A very tight gap there, as you said. And, and United's position in second, no longer safe. Um, four teams, three spots for the Champions League. It's going to be a fight to the finish. Arsenal now seven points back of Tottenham, eight points out of fourth. Their Champions League dreams may start to be a little a little dashed. Although, as uh, I believe Mohamed Elneny said, you know, they're still fighting for that Premier League title. You You go, guys. Keep keep the dream alive. Keep it keep, keep it alive, boys. Yeah. Cause, oh yeah. boy! And a uh, fun fact oh, of the week. Oh, oh boy, is right. <laughs> fun fact of the week is I'm gonna like to do this for the rest of the season. Um, so you could take ten points. Uh, yeah, ten points away from Burnley, and they would be tied for 17th place, just missing the drop zone based on a goal differential. So they would fall from seventh to 17th. If you gave Burnley ten points. They would jump from seventh to sixth. That's that's the gap right there, ladies and gentlemen. The gap from seventh to seventeenth is about the same as seventh to sixth. So at the bottom of your heart, the relegation zone, there's three teams at 27 points sitting just outside. That's Palace, Swansea, and Huddersfield. Southampton is in 18th. Stoke is in 19th. They're one and two points clear of safety, respectively. West Brom is in last. They are, last. They are seven points adrift. Uh, still very tight down there. None from, like, I will say Watford, who are only four points clear on down, are really safe. Even Bournemouth only has 31. It's going to be yeah. nuts at yeah. the end. Um, speaking of nuts, let's head to the Champions. We're back. Um, hmm. Taking that big two-month break. Between the end of the group stage and the knockout stage. Um, things started off with a bang as Man City destroys Basel Exposition at St. Jacob's Park. 4-0. Ilkay Gundogan. Did you know he still plays for City? I didn't. He's still there. Uh, he scored a brace in that match. Bernardo Silva also with a goal. Two goals in the span of 20 minutes for the Citizens. And then Aguero just a few minutes later added the third. They would go into the half down up 3-0, I should say, and just continued on from there. So Man City with a dominating victory and a lead that is impervious as they head back to Manchester uh, for the second leg on March 7th. Other leg that will be taking place second on March 7th. We'll talk about this match a little bit. That is Juventus 2 Tottenham Hotspur, two. It was 10 minutes to forget for Spurs as Gonzalo Higuain scored in the second minute of play, just burying a shot and catching Hugo Lloris off. And then Ben Davies clatters into his man in the ninth minute to set up Higuain for a penalty. And you think the world is collapsing, as I believe someone said on Twitter. This isn't even a game you rage quit. You just don't even stop it. You just pull your laptop closed, walk outside, and walk to the horizon far, far away. <laughs> but Tottenham didn't do that. Um, Tottenham uh, got back into the game very quickly. Harry Kane then scores in the 35th minute as he beats uh, a one-on-one -on -one with Gigi Buffon. Then Erickson in the 71st minute on a free kick puts it below the wall catches Buffon off guard and gets the equalizing goal for Spurs as they take a 2-2 draw back to Wembley, which means a nil-nil result now sees Tottenham through. Even a 1-1 result will see Tottenham through. That is amazing. And one thing I'm going to point out here, I talked about Dembele. He was fantastic. The fight, as we mentioned earlier from this team, to go down in Turin, 2-0 in 10 minutes is your first knockout stage game, I believe, in eight years. I want to say for Tottenham Hotspur since uh, Real Madrid and Gareth Bale and all that. To do that and pull out a 2-2 draw is fantastic. And I want to give big props 
to a man I think that defined this comeback, and that is Ben Davies, who had an atrocious penalty given away early on to set up Juventus' second goal, and then came right back. He didn't get down. He didn't get down on himself. He got attacking. He got forward, and he set up play after play after play for Tottenham, and chance after chance. He was part of the reason they put so much pressure on Juventus. And and while Juventus did still have some chances later on in the game, notably a Iguain missed penalty just before the stroke of the first half ending, this was a lot of waste, Tottenham's game. For the last 80 minutes, they were the better team. And they were the better team. If you just saw those 80 minutes, you would have said, oh, Tottenham pretty much walked Juventus off their own pitch. And that's that to me is amazing. To, to start that way and have that kind of resilience, Wes, that's... That is not so Spurs. No, that was uh, that was big time Oof. Spurs. I mean, man, that was big time. Uh, I was watching it. Um, <laughs> after about ten minutes, I was one of those. <sighs> that was ugly. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> Yikes! That was. Rough. Um, and I mean, it was it was bad, man, yeah. and it was Spurs. You know, um, self-destructing. Ben Davies looked like he needed to be playing, you know, Sunday league somewhere. Uh, you know, defensively, I still don't think Sanchez had a great match. Um, no, Sanchez but, uh, had a good match. Uh, Aurier, Aurier had a very bad match. I thought Sanchez oh, actually Aurier played very well. I, I didn't think Sanchez was great, but uh, yeah, Aurier and Aurier, of course, he's the one who shouldn't have issues with this. Yeah. He's the, one who's, he's the one who's got the experience. Yes. <laughs> you know, playing for PSG. But of course, I mean, hey, he played for PSG. He's used to self-destructing. Mm. So. Uh, yeah. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but, hey, for him, uh, great job by Spurs to come back. And they started to win that high line. And they they just kept pushing Juventus deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, Harry Kane had a free run and a header that he probably should have scored to make it two to one. Mm-hmm. Um, but right there, you started seeing that, you know, as vaunted as that defense was, Spurs were finding cracks. They were finding spots. Harry Kane was finding space. And you just had this feeling that, you know, they were going to have opportunities. It was going to come down to could they take advantage of opportunities mm-hmm. and at the end of the day they did uh they did exactly what they should have done um to me they were they're a better team than Juventus were mm-hmm. um I think one part of it it kind of goes back sort of to our Pogba talk earlier that we um Serie A is better this year don't get me wrong Serie mm-hmm. A is good but man yeah, they're just some teams I, I think there. I really think there are just there are three teams coming out of the Premier League that are in the Champions League, uh, and that City, Liverpool, and Tottenham. People don't see anything like that every day. No, they don't see that in their league. I mean, this where is a, they're this is a Juventus that fast. Go ahead. I was just gonna say this is a Juventus team that has not given up a goal this calendar year coming into this match. No, like. No, I think it's been like eight matches since they've given up a home goal. Yeah. Um, but they hadn't seen this. No. The speed and the precision and the power mm-hmm. and just the wave, the waves of attack that those three uh, Premier League teams bring. And, of course, we saw it in Liverpool's match where the hell. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, of course, Basel got it on their end for Man City, but... I mean, it was just. I think Juventus are sort of to most teams when they're down. To, oh, this thing's over. We ain't got a chance in hell. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing: in Italy, you don't have a chance. This isn't an Italian football team they were playing though. This was Tottenham Hotspur. This was a team who just they. You know, we talked about the mentality is all right. We're down. Dig deeper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we might not win. We might not get the result we want, but I got some. And once they started finding opportunities, it was just a matter of putting the ball in the back of the net. 
you got Harry Kane. That helps. Mm -hmm. And then Christian Eriksen just kills him on the wall, goes under the wall. It it was a fantastic, it was a fantastic uh, 75 minutes from Spurs. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they find themselves in a very good spot. If they hadn't been so bad early, they could just about have this thing put away. But that said, they found themselves in a very good spot. They're going back to Wembley. Um, Spurs have made Wembley a tough place to go and win this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's basically Juventus need a win or a draw. And I don't think either Spurs or Juventus are going to give, quote, another high-scoring draw. Mm-hmm. So Juventus are going to have to go find a goal. Yeah, it's It's going to be tough. Um, this is definitely not definitely not going to write Juventus off yet, but this is this Tottenham have put themselves in a very strong position for the second leg, going back at home with those two away goals. Those those could be crucial. Um, speaking of away goals, though, um, five is greater than two, and that's exactly what Liverpool put on Porto um, going into their uh, first Champions League knockout match today. Uh, Mane, he's still scoring. He's got the hat trick, and then Salah and Fer- and then Salah and Firmino added goals alongside him. Uh, the Portuguese leaders were humbled at home as Liverpool will have their European night in the knockout stage at Anfield. Be what some would assume, and hopefully will be a bit of a celebratory march uh, against Porto to go to the round of eight. But we shall see. But on this night, Wes. Uh, Liverpool in a match that some people had as being relatively close going in. I don't know that I'd agree with that, but that's what some people said. Liverpool were clearing away the best team. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't take like offense. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I don't take offense to it. I don't care. Um, But, you know, for Liverpool, they were kind of in a position like Spurs where they were walking with a team that now historically, obviously Liverpool, but that hasn't exactly been the case in mm-hmm. a decade. I mean, first time since 2009 that we're in the mm-hmm. stage. I guess how many of these guys were there in 2009? <laughs> that would be none of them. Yeah. Um, you know, really, when you look at our club, the most Champions League experience was Virgil at Celtic. Yeah. Um, was uh, Salah when he was with, you know, Roma and Chelsea mm-hmm. and Basel when he was there. Um, you know, Mane, Mane hadn't really run the Champions League for Mano. Mm-hmm. Henderson had been there when we had been there. Um, yeah. Now, uh, now, Milner, James Milner had some experience, obviously, experienced Champions League when he was at City. Mm-hmm. And you saw him playing today. But, man, I mean, we got a lot of guys who have not at this point. Um, and really the one thing going for them is, well, hey, you know, you play for Liverpool and we, we, expect, we expect to be able to play at this level. So that's, that's a good thing, I think, for the players is that, you know, the fans aren't nervous about it. Um, you know, newspapers have to sell papers, so they need, they need to make up some stuff and do things. But in this match, Liverpool far and away were the better team. That said, Porto were missing probably their two most important players. Mm. Uh, their center back, the the Brazilian who, I do not remember his name, but he got sent off against mm-hmm. in the last um, group stage match, and he missed today's match. And that's their starting central defensive. I think he's their captain. And then uh, Abubakar, the, the striker, fantastic striker for him. Uh, he wasn't able to play today. And, I mean, this is a guy who scored over 100 goals playing in European leagues and has played at a high level. So they were definitely, um, you know, they were definitely at a disadvantage. But that said, man, wow. Wow. Liverpool pressed them to the ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mane getting a hat trick is not how to get you know, especially by his oh, by his standards and by what our standards have become for him sure. after last year, he's he's really been not great. You know, we talked about lately not decisive in some of the things he's done. 
Uh, he's had some moments this year that have stuck out that really leave you scratching your head. But, I mean, he brought it today, man. The hat trick, Salah. Whew. You know, Muhammad Salah. What was it earlier this year? Someone said he's a poacher. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, big fucking poacher he is. Did you see that goal today? Yeah. Where I think he took it like two touches off his foot, one off his knee, one off his <laughs> It was just like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this, 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 and finish. Fuck you all. He and Harry Kane, uh, the biggest poachers in the world. Yeah, him and Harry Kane, yeah. He can't do anything but just stand in front of goal and, you know, put back in put back. Yeah. And then on the last goal, the Camino put in five. Firmino put in five. Or maybe he put in four. I can't remember. He is the fourth. The, yeah. Okay, the Firmino goal showed the devastation that Liverpool can cause with their counter attacking. Mm-hmm. Um. And look, I know there's some great teams in this tournament. Um, I'm looking at two of them right here, PSG and uh, Real. We'll get to that in a little bit. If there is a better counterattacking Liverpool, I don't know. Once again, that's not saying Liverpool's the best team in Europe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but with the guys they have at the back, in the middle, and obviously up front, I don't think there's a team that fires off a faster, more precise counterattack than Liverpool are capable of, and you saw it today. When Liverpool get out in space and they can play one, two, three pass football and and just move wherever they want, no one's better, man. And Firmino, you know, Firmino has you – know, don't forget, back before the season, Riker can carry the load. Mm-hmm. Roberto Firmino is one of the best center forwards in Europe. Mohamed Salah, I-, I was thinking about today, if Mohamed Salah keeps scoring, and let's say he scores, God, I mean, he's already over 30 goals this season. By the end of the season, if they keep going in the Premier League and the Champions League, I mean, he could be up near 50 goals. Mm-hmm. If he does that and gets Egypt out of the group stage in the World Cup, Oof. you can talk Messi or Ronaldo all you want. Mark, I don't know how you could keep him off of the podium for the Ballon d'Or. Sure. He's been that damn good. Yeah. Um, and when you just, you know, when you think about, you know, to the international part, you know, I mean, it, it's Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's not playing for Brazil. He's not playing for Argentina. He's not playing for, you know, Portugal. They're not going to win the World Cup. Uh, but, you know, they shouldn't even really qualify for the World Cup. Uh, Mohamed Salah, to me right now, we had this, we had this, I, I made this argument in 2013-14 um, for Luis Suarez. I say, you can, you can have Messi and Ronaldo. I'll take, back then Suarez, right now, I'll take Salah. They're just, they're just doing it, man. Mm-hmm. And Salah just continues to do it. And a lot of the time, the threat of Salah doing it. <laughs> has teams shitting their pants and opening up passing lanes and running for Liverpool. And that's exactly what happened today, man. Completely outclassed Porto. Uh, like you said, you know, in, in three weeks at Anfield, it should be a coronation walk. Um, you know, Liverpool can start kind of making their plans for the quarterfinals because not only was it five goals, it was five away goals. Yeah. <laughs> so right now we have to lose 6 nil. Ooh. And I don't think that's happening. <laughs> we we can hope. So, yeah, we we hope, but I don't believe that's going to happen. So I feel pretty confident. Um, but a great game for Liverpool. I said earlier in the year I thought Liverpool may be a better Champions League side than a Premier League side. Um, and you saw it today. You know, and once again, I go back. When you're on the road, when you're on the road, it's about the counter attack. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and Liverpool, I think Liverpool may be the best counter attack in. So, I mean, I think Liverpool can go nearly anywhere and get two goals on the road. Mm-hmm. PSG, they can get two goals. Real, I think they can get two goals. Barcelona, I think they can get two goals. If Liverpool come out much like Tottenham in Turin, hey, I want two goals and I'll go home. Yeah. And I'll take my chances at home. Whether it be 2-2 two, two and I have my two away goals. Hell, if, it, if I lose 3-2 to two and have two away goals as Liverpool, mm-hmm. I'm sitting there going, all right, yeah, okay. Okay. we got two away goals. I can, I can beat you one nothing at Anfield. You two one at Anfield. Mm-hmm. So um, 
I just I, I think Liverpool are almost more. We're better equipped for the Champions League than we are for the Premier League. Well, and I think you saw a big chunk of it today. One of those teams you mentioned uh, is going to need a couple goals uh, if they want to advance. And that is what we were calling the tie of the round. That is Real Madrid, PSG, Madrid with a 3-1 victory over PSG, Marco Rabio with the 33rd minute goal that put the visitors ahead. Sorry, Adrian Rabio um, put the visitors ahead. Uh, but a late penalty in the first half got uh, Real Madrid back in it, 1-1. Ronaldo with a goal in the 83rd. And then Marcelo, following up just moments later, gives the defending champions a 3-1 lead heading to France in a couple weeks' time. Remember when everybody was saying Spurs only beat Real Madrid because they were shit? Yeah. They were shit at the time. They're good now. <laughs> um, but Wes, I mean, this is, you know, oh. Neymar, very good first half, invisible in the second half. Mbappe, very good in the first half, nearly invisible in the second half. This is a PSG team that unless they're just trying to do a reverse of what they did happen last year uh, against them from Barcelona, this is what they were supposed to do. They, they're going to win Lee Un. They're probably going to win whatever fucking domestic cups are there. This sure. is supposed to be their tournament. And while they did get maybe a little bit unlucky in the draw to drop Real Madrid in the round of 16, this is this is everything you're playing for this season. And they are now down in the hole 2-0 going to the Parc des Princes. Absolutely. Um, just shocking. Yeah. Shocking. You, you would think... But you know what? Just, just like I said about Liverpool, right there, Madrid may be better suited for this than La Liga, mm-hmm. where it's a it's two matches. It's home. It's away. They still have Cristiano Ronaldo, and hell, he's done pretty well in the Champions League this year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you still have the. You still have the uh, threat of having to go to the Bernabeu. They've got guys who've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. I'm talking multiple Champions League winners. And, I mean, that is... that That's that's something that can't be discounted at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Real Madrid, you know what? They're dead in La Liga. But in the Champions League, in the Champions League it's long live the king until the king is dead. And right now, the king is uh, the king. May be old, he may be creaky, but he's looking damn good at the moment because he's got the he's got the hot young, you know, the young guy who's coming for his crown. He's got his damn foot on his throat right now. What did Omar say, Wes? Don't come. You come at a king, you best not miss. Yeah, PSG might have missed today. And now that's it. Yeah, let's take this into perspective. PSG went to the Bernabeu. They got a goal. They got a goal. And away go. Yep. So right now, if they go home and win two 0 they're through. Yeah, that's that is true. That's and you true. know what? They can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we saw this happen last year to this very event to this very PSG team. Yeah. On a much bigger scale. Mm-hmm. I believe. Oh shit! You know, I'm talking about Liverpool here. <laughs> they went and beat. <laughs> they won. What they win four 0 against Barcelona. No, you're, it's backwards. They had the lead against Barcelona. Yeah. And Barcelona came back against them. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think yeah. they had won like four 0 in the first leg. Uh four one, I believe it was. Was it four? Okay. Well, I mean, they had demolished. Yeah. Them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They crushed them. And then it all fell apart. Mm-hmm. So, just because of that, just because of the firepower, gee, you certainly cannot count them out. No. Um, but you know, we we kind of saw from Madrid today that this is why they're Real Madrid. Yeah, I mean they're still uh, those guys are still ultra ultra talent. Uh, it just hasn't come together. Yeah, you know, I, I saw a really heard a really interesting stat this week of the last eight times that's right eight times that Real Madrid have won the European Cup mm-hmm. last season last season was the only time that they also won the domestic. Wow. That was the only time in the last eight times that they did the So, 
you know, they're, they're kind of used to in the past. We win the Champions League, win Europe. So, you know, for them, I don't think, I don't think you can look at that domestic form and be too worried if you're a Real Madrid fan. Mm -hmm. you know, the only thing you worry about is going into the, going into, you know, who you're playing in the part to Prince in three weeks. Real Madrid aren't scared. Sure. That's one thing. And that's that's where for PSG, this isn't a great matchup because PSG kind of, they, they need people to fear them. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they've run into maybe one of two. Do not fear anyone mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm going to throw it out there. I think those three teams are um, Madrid, Barcelona, I'm going to throw this out here crazily. I'm going to say Liverpool because I think Klopp's too damn crazy to be scared of anyone. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, Liverpool are going to play. They're going to press and, and, you know, torpedoes be damned. Liverpool are going to play the same way. <laughs> you know, everybody else is like, eh, I need to do this or this or this. Barcelona's going to play possession. Real Madrid's going to do Real Madrid. And Liverpool's going to run. <laughs> so, uh, for PSG, this may actually have turned into a nightmare matchup. Just because of everyone to play, this wasn't who you want. Yeah, yeah, easily. This was one of the worst draws they could have gotten of those uh, second place teams um, mm -hmm. from that pot. That is that is a brutal draw. But they will have it all to play for on March 6th when they head to oh. Paris. Uh, okay. Next week, uh, your first leg remaining matchups will be uh, Sevilla and Manchester United, Shakhtar mm -hmm. versus Roma, Chelsea versus Barcelona, and Bayern versus Besiktas. So we'll see how those matches turn out. Um, and uh, go I personally, going in next week, I think we're going to have uh, four Premier League teams. I think you're right. I think you're right. I do, I do. I'm going to hope you're right in that, that fourth one is Tottenham. Um, so as we as we move on from the Champions League for a moment, we're going to head quickly to the FA Cup. Uh, that does, again, start this Friday. Uh, Leicester taking on Sheffield United. Chelsea takes on Hull on Saturday. Uh, you have Sheffield Wednesday versus Swansea. West Brom Southampton. Brighton versus Coventry. And Huddersfield versus Manchester United. On Sunday, Rockdale versus Tottenham Hotspur. We'll see how the pitch is. And then on Monday, you have Wigan versus Man City. That's your FA Cup. Um, all right, real quick through the news and notes. Um, Leicester playing the petty bitch card. Uh, they <laughs> don't really want to sell Riyad Mahrez to a Premier League rival. Can't say I blame them. Can't say it's surprising. But hey, this is the story that keeps on giving. So we'll see. We'll see. This one. This one's going to be going to the end of the season. We'll I'm not gonna lie. I kind of, I kind of like it from Leicester yeah. because you know, once again, they're saying they're saying to Mares, "What you're, you know, you, uh, you fucked us. We're not gonna sell you to a Premier League team. You want to go to France? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't think Barcelona's coming in for you, champ. Yeah. <laughs> you might have kind of fucked yourself over with your little temper tantrum. Woof. Not. So, uh, not great. Yeah. Hey, Ed. You know what? I raised two children. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> our, our other story: uh, the the new president of U.S. Soccer is in, and yeah. in what has been described by some news outlets as the not establishment candidate, Carlos Cordero, who was the vice president of U.S. Soccer, is going to be the next president. Um, Soccer United marketing's manager Kathy Carter was the favorite. And was seen as the air quotes establishment person, um, but Cordero sixty one is going to be the man to replace Gulati. Uh, he served with U.S. Soccer since two thousand seven, and he was the vice president since twenty sixteen. He is a graduate of Harvard, great, and he's worked for many years at Goldman Sachs. Drain the swamp, everyone! It's worked so well in Washington. We did it with U.S. Soccer. Bring in more Goldman Sachs people. That's that's what we need. If Donald Trump was alive, this never would have happened. God, that'd be awesome if he was dead. Um, oh, Ed. Oh. You might need to, you might need to not have no, that. No, I get one. I Ed, get one. And we don't need a Russia probe. I get one. <laughs> we don't need a probe into the foreign affairs. I get one. Um, but on, on a more serious note, 
Um, this is this has been hailed by some as well. Martino, Winalda, others, they probably weren't realistic candidates, so this is probably the best we could do in this election, and I would say to that, fuck you! I, the best wasn't good enough. It's it's not. We, we failed. We have a guy who, in his opening remarks, seems to be more focused on the U.S. winning the World Cup bid and not winning the World Cup. You Which know, uh, I think... Our World Cup bid was already. Yeah, yeah. This is someone who Hope Solo absolutely eviscerated before and after he was elected. This is. I I, I want to give him a chance. I want to be a big boy, <sighs> and give him a chance, Wes. But I I I am I am very I'm being skeptical, dog. I'm right just, now, I'm just waiting when he hires a former to be the new manager of the. Oh gosh, Ed! I think uh, I think the the rock and roll Hall of Fame, one of the greatest rock bands of all time, the Who, mm. summed it up the best. They said, "Meet the old, meet the new boss." Same as the old boss. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I, I, under what establishment is this guy not part of the establishment? I don't know. I mean, is it, well, he wasn't the, the okay. Yeah. But, I mean, where exactly did he not work? Yeah. In U.S. <laughs> I mean, Jesus Christ, that's so stupid. Oh God, I don't, I don't know, I don't know who's having a work. People looking at their top. I think it's a three-way run between the NFL, uh, United States Soccer, and the NCAA. Oh. Oof. Oof. Jesus, Mark God. Emmert's not very good. Oh, Mark Emmert's horrible. Yeah, they're all horrible. That's the they're all terrible. Oh, look at Kyle Martino. Jesus Christ, he's gorgeous. It's he true. would have been magnificent. He would have. Oh, and his wife would have been the first lady. The only good thing, maybe, is that maybe this man is smart enough to bring in a lot of. Because this man doesn't seem to know terribly much about soccer. Um, <laughs> always, always a good thing. A good um, it, 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 the hope is that he brings in a lot of soccer people to make the soccer decisions. That, and then maybe he just makes the business decisions, I guess. And that, I, I, even even if you don't know that much, I want my president to say, our goal as U.S. soccer is to win the World Cup. Period. That's what. Why do we play, Wes? We play to win the game. That's to win the game. Thank as, you. As they say at Liverpool, a f- you play for trophies. You play for glory. Exactly. And this is. <sighs> a, 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 um. And here, and here's my thing, man. It's gonna have to. Um, we're gonna have to wait and see. How much is this guy? How much is he in the pocket of MLS? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that, that to me, I don't want to hate on MLS, but they make it so damn hard not to. It's true. Thanks, Don Garber. M- MLS needs to realize that everything in the world. Mm-hmm. But that said, you know, that's the thing. You know, MLS almost needs to run as a separate, a fully separate entity mm-hmm. of you, of the United States. Soccer Federation, but I don't, it's like we need MLS, but we need MLS to do the right. Thing. Mm-hmm. Mike Lee says, "Do the right thing." MLS needs to do the right thing. Yeah, it's just there's so much, there's so much to go into what's screwed up with the United States soccer right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I mean, this is a yeah. pretty long pod anyway, so we're not going into all that. Let's just put it this way. Carlos Cordero, not impressed. No, and um, so yay. But sir, hey, what have I what have I always said? Said about other everyone, I'm not impressed. Prove me wrong. There you go. Maybe maybe, maybe he will. Maybe what I say will. what I say to Mario Balotelli? Score twenty goals. Prove me wrong. He scored one. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did I say? Oh crap! Oh, what did I say when AJ Pierce? Oh God. Prove me wrong. He didn't. 
He, he exploded our entire club. He did not. Uh, what did I say to Bobby Valentine? Prove me wrong. He didn't. We finished last. If we're gonna if we're gonna keep going on famous football head coach quotes, oh, they were who we thought they were. <laughs> or is or is the great Jim Morrison? Playoffs. <laughs> God. God. Jim, yeah. stop talking to Arsenal. Playoffs. Oh, that's the only way they're winning the league. Um, oh. So that's going to do it for our soccer talk for the day. And we end on such a high note. Wes, as we hit the watch four, what are you watching in the week that was or the week that will be? Nothing because the fucking Olympics are ruining everything. Everybody's on hiatus. Yeah. All my shows. I'm not happy about it. I'm All sorry. my shows are on hiatus. I'm very sorry. It's like I kept looking at like, why are you not coming back to the end of February? Why? Oh, that's why. Yeah. Now, granted, watch a little bit of the Olympics. I don't. I don't hate the Olympics. Mm, they're fine. Um, I actually all I ever do is bitch about the Winter Olympics. <laughs> um, yeah, we had it on at work. It was great at work. You know, I work nights all weekend. Great right? because you can basically turn on NBC Sports and they have the Olympics on. Pretty much <laughs> at night when I was working. So, I mean, that was great. You know, I get to see a lot of uh, the now Tanith White, formerly Tanith Belden, mm-hmm. who I just loved way too much back in her heyday. She's great. Um, my beloved Dylan Dreyer. Now, she's, she might, she's got a spot on the flu. Oh, no. Korea with the flu might not be the best place to be. I have yet to see Lady Rebecca yet. I don't know if I'm just missing her time. I believe she's on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, we'll see how I was working overnight. So, you know. Um, yeah, so I, I guess if I'm watching anything, I've been watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, other than that, I mean, just trying to catch up on stuff. Um, did I mention the Waco miniseries? Yes, yes, you did. I did. Okay, I watched the, I watched the first episode of that, man. That was that was really good. Mm-hmm. Taylor Kitchener's playing um, uh, David Koresh. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're, we're used to Taylor Kitchener being like beautiful man hunk, right? Yes. I mean, God's Tim Riggins. In in uh, in Lone Survivor, man, that was a ten of my. He was a gorgeous, badass of a man. Here he's David Koresh. He's a creepy little fucker. <laughs> he's a, he did a really good job. So, yeah, I mean, uh, bobsledding, losing, <clears throat> men's figure skating. Adam Adam Ritter Ritter Ritter, mm-hmm. Ritter. Dude was magnificent, man. Oh, it was magnificent. Um, I am, uh, currently on, I, I've, I've now, as of tonight, finished season one of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I, I am oh, through. Nine-Nine! Cap- Captain Holt, showing game. I'm a <sighs> big fan of Captain Holt, showing game. Very, very nice. And, uh, in his, in his big plan to send Jake Pearl to undercover with the Italian oh, yeah. mafia. It's very nice, very nice. Um, I, I, I very much enjoy, um... All, all of the characters are, are really starting to grow on me. I believe Stephanie Beatrice's character is is still my favorite and is just super wonderful to be around and how awful she is. Um, but, my, oh, but, she, but she's awful. It's true. It's like she's not really a bad person. No, no, no. She's, she's awful. Just, in the, she's awful she's in our hard. April Ludgate sort of way. Exactly. Yeah, she's, she's, like, she's like a horror. Like I'll stab you, version of April. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I love that. I love April. So, so. and uh, and once again, as I've said with many of them, her character will greatly mm. uh, grow. In- Exciting! I was just, it was just really, really fun uh, to to blast through that. I will say the one fun part about going through a season, just like episode after episode after episode, uh-huh. is hitting that stretch midway through season one, where it's like, hey, here's a Halloween episode. Hey, here's our Thanksgiving episode. <laughs> hey, here's our Christmas episode. Enjoy! It's like, exactly. wow, we we went through all three holidays in an hour. That was great, guys. And I'm going to tell you, as uh, the more that goes, uh, if you'll, you'll enjoy it. Oh, and, wow. you know, I know you significant other one named producer Jackie mm-hmm. uh, especially one named producer Jackie apparently are glaring at Wes like, <laughs> how dare you how dare you uh, compare Ed to Jake Peralta yes how dare you remember Ed he'll evolve yeah. Jake Peralta will evolve <laughs> <laughs> but, but you do have some Peralta's in it too. 
when I when I finish the when I finally finish and get caught up to where to where it is in the present, I am going to have to actually ask for your thoughts on why you believe that. If I haven't figured it out by myself, um, which who knows, maybe over five seasons I will have. Um, speaking, I may, of, I may have to go back and start watching again myself. Hey, it's really really good. Um, but Wes, now that we finished the watch four, let's end this pod with something that kind of dominated the audio at the beginning, and that's the <laughs> WWE. So please regale us with the latest happenings of the WWE in this edition of So Raw. Well, if you didn't catch it at the beginning of the show, uh, the boy is home tonight. The boy's been gone a lot. He's been he's been over at his grandma's a lot, and. Um, had not been able to see all the um, all of the uh, Royal Rumble matches. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, wanted to see. Uh, we watched the men's match last week, and tonight he looks at me. Hey, do we have time to watch the women's match? I was like, Yeah, yeah, we got time. Let's let's burn through it. So that's what we were watching at the beginning of the show. Tonight. Of course, you just go back and listen to a few of our former episodes. And- Rumble true. matches. Anyway. Um, yeah, man, this week, uh, the biggest thing is we are ramping up for <laughs> uh, our two pay-per-views coming up before WrestleMania. That's Fast Lane for SmackDown, and the first one we're going to have will be the Elimination Chamber. And it, it's kind of like, holy shit, the Elimination Chamber just... I think they started looking at it, and suddenly they were like, huh, we could do this, this. Oh, wait a minute. We could add people to the Elimination Chamber. Perfect. So... um. After Monday night, well, we ended up having on Monday night a last chance match for the Elimination Chamber. Basically, the guys who had lost the first matches um, all got a chance in a, it was supposed to be a fatal four-way match uh, for the last spot, uh, for the last spot in the Elimination Chamber. Well, what they ended up doing is um, a kind of a, a, something that's come across upon us lately. Uh, Jason Jordan has picked up a legitimate injury. Um, and he's gonna he's had surgery, he's gonna be out. God, could be a good could be a good four, five, six months that we miss Jason Jordan. Um I believe Jason Jordan, of course, was tagging with WrestleMania. And Jordan going out suddenly left Seth Rollins with Adam. Hmm. Now, leaving Seth Rollins with nothing to do, that's not a good thing because Seth Rollins is one of your superstars on the Raw brand. You know, this is a former multiple-time world champion. Um, he's one of the more popular guys on there. Of course, former member of the Shield. So, I believe, my belief is that the original plan for the final, the final spot match was to put Finn Balor over, because Finn Balor, obviously, very popular guys. Um, you get him into the Elimination Chamber match, and you know that that opens up that opens up some things. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Balor was in that match. Well, suddenly, you know, you kind of have Seth Rollins sitting right here. So they did an angle where Seth Rollins basically hmm. that made it a fatal five way, and Ed to end the match. <laughs> um, we had a double pinfall. Whoa! Where both Rollins and Finn Balor. Both pinned Bray Wyatt at the same time. Whoa. And WWE's uh, way of fixing They're after my own heart, man. We're adding a pod. Of course. So we will have the first ever seven-man Elimination Chamber match oh because, hey, now we put in both Rollins and Finn Balor, which makes me very happy because, as you know, I'm a huge mm-hmm. for both Rollins and mm-hmm. a huge mark. Um... So that's where we sit now. We've got, let me see if I can do them off the top of my head. We've got Braun Strowman, mm-hmm. who's got to win this damn thing somehow. I mean, <laughs> the guy's, Jesus Christ. Oh, and I got to tell you what he did on Oh, wow. He was great. We have Braun Strowman. We have Elias. We have John C. We have John <laughs> Cena. Yeah. We have Roman Reigns. We have The Miz, Finn Balor, and Seth Rollins. I would tell you the truth. I mean, putting seven guys in, I don't think you could come up with a better seven. I mean, mm-hmm. those are. Phenomenal. Every one of those guys right now is phenomenal. Even John Cena, who we love to hate. Even Roman Reigns, who we love to hate. You need them there. It is a monster Elimination Chamber match where really 
you know, truthfully, you could see any one of them. There's not a real shit guy in the match. Now, Elias was. But, you know, shit. Rollins has been the champion. Miz has been the champion. Strowman should be the champion. Reigns has been the champion. Cena's been the champion. You know, Finn Balor's been the universal champion. Everybody in there, other than Braun Strowman, who's the biggest, baddest motherfucker, has been. So, I mean, shit, any of them can win, you know? Yeah, you, you don't really, you don't have a jobber in there. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about Elimination Chamber. I'm not going to be, I am pretty fucking stoked for that. So that's going to be great. Um, <laughs> the moment of the night, Monday night, though, once again involved the greatness of Ron Strowman. <laughs> because as I said, he would be the greatest 1980s. He said, God, I needed him like choke slamming Hulk Hogan. Um, Elias, who is, uh, is one of the heels right now. Um, I've talked about Elias on here before. He comes out, he plays a guitar, sings a, so- sings a song for everybody. You know, ba- and basically his songs have a nice little riff, and then he starts talking shit about your city. Mm-hmm. That's what he does, you know. <laughs> and they were in San Jose this past week, so he's talking shit about. And the next thing we know, they they spotlight up on the uh, up on the uh, stage, and Braun Strowman walks out to sing a song. And and instead of having a guitar, because this Strowman we're talking about. Braun Strowman has a full bass. Of course. I'm talking the big bass that usually you stand on the floor and play with a and play. <laughs> with a, Braun Strowman put it on his knee and started playing it like a little guitar. Oh god. Because he is just he is the monster of among men. Um he ends up attacking uh well he ends up coming down to the ring and just chucks it right over his shoulder and carries it once again like someone would uh, comes down the ring, beats the shit out of Elias, and then for good measure decides to bust the base over Elias' back. Of course. <laughs> and this thing just explodes. I mean, obviously it's gimmick. They, they usually make my a wood or something. They totally gimmick them up. But it was it was such an amazing visual <laughs> to see him just decimate Elias. Oh, it was so good. And Braun Strowman just once again goes down as You know, if the NFL wants ratings, someone sign Braun Strowman. Don't make him wear a helmet. Oh, man. Because he doesn't need a helmet. And and get rid of the uh, unnecessary rubber. It'll be amazing. Just amazing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, though, uh, so that kind of th- that kind of sets up the chamber. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick till next week and talk a little bit about uh, SmackDown because they're still the chamber is gonna take place first, so SmackDown is still um, kind of finalizing what they're gonna be doing mm-hmm. uh, next week. Next week, of course, and I don't hey yeah uh, we'll talk about it a little bit real quick. We're not gonna have a ton to talk about next week. Uh, we don't have Premier League this week. It's true. Um, I guess we will have some Champions League next week, mm-hmm. but. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, I of course will not be here. It's a work week for me, so I'll be I'll be kind of phoning it in. I won't have a to talk about, so no real Anfield corner. So next week I'm going to break down SmackDown going into fast. Fantastic. Um, so that will take care of this week's so wrong. Oh, fantastic! Well, we will look forward to that next week as we will do be doing it from parts unknown as we uh, we we patch it together. Um, but another great episode in the books here for episode one hundred and 97 uh that is going to do it for this episode it's one more time we are brought to you by ngsc sports and ngscsports.com we never stop as well as our sports baseball you can find all of them on twitter as well as us as a collective we are at afa pod Wes, you are i'm at west bradshaw 21 i am at edward green you can also find us on facebook instagram and youtube the our parent show the all new sports show you can also find that podcast on youtube along with all of our great non-soccer related video programming uh, that we did back in the day you can also email us all new sports show at gmail.com finally big thanks to our podcast providers including podbean.com spreaker stitcher iHeartRadio, the tune in radio app google play music and the itunes music store so like we said we'll be back next week piece together little little pieces here and there west calling from parts unknown to give you a recap of that fa cup uh, from this weekend, as well as the midweek Champions League matches taking place next week. 
Um, so that's going to do it for this episode, though. But, Wes, do you have anything to add before we get out of here? Uh, pitchers and catchers are reported in. Woohoo! Oh, praise so excited. Those, those glorious words. Mm. Those glorious words. Um, hey, if you want to check out an interesting read, uh, a good long form read today on Jake Peavy on Ooh. Bleacher Report. Uh, apparently, Jake Peavy lost 15 to 20 million in a pocket. Oh. Uh, well, not, and not totally his fault. Um, his uh, he had a financial advisor that he trusted, and um, the guy took his money and uh, apparently it was for a, a secondary ticketing site, you know, kind of like a StubHub, something like that. But it mm-hmm. wasn't StubHub. Um, and the guy went in and was investing his uh, people's money into it, and it came out the reason he was doing it is because he getting uh, massive uh, finder fees hmm. for these people. So it wasn't that it was that great of a deal, obviously. It was just, you know, this guy was making personal bank off of finder fees. JP lost a big chunk of his, uh, big chunk of what was going to be his retirement on that. Um, talked about him uh, <clears throat> while all this was going on. He His last season with the Giants, mm-hmm. um, he was having to fly from San Francisco to Texas for depositions, for court appearances all over this. Uh, While that was going on, his wife uh, filed for divorce. So, Jake Peavy's kind of gone through a lot, but he's he's actually looking to uh, make a major league. Oh, hope he... uh, Says says the... uh, Well, well, you know, he says the the time away has given him a chance to rest, recuperate. He said right now... Now, you know, everybody says this when they're trying to get a job. He says, you know, right now his stuff's as good as it was when he was in his early 20s. And, uh, and his arm's not tired, so he thinks he's still got another season in him. But says he'd like to come back and be able just not kind of have it happen like it did for him. Hmm. Um, hey, you know, we always have, we have a good place. Jake Peavy back in 2013. Oh, yes. Uh, with the Red Sox. And actually in it, he bought one of the duck boats <laughs> and has the duck boat on his property down and out. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Peavy's actually a pretty cool guy. You know, he's one of the you know, he's one of those guys, you know, you, you always, you're probably like me, you know, you feel, man, if I have 125 million bucks, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy myself, <laughs> you know, but PB's, PB's been really good about, you know, giving to, you know, help people out and, you know, it talks in there about how he, you know, he, he does help out those who can't help themselves so mm-hmm. much. Um, but at the same time, you know, he, uh, he, you know, he, he likes to buy cool stuff. Yes. And sometimes he buys it and gives it away. I mean, shit, you know, so, um, so, you know, it's not like he's bought like a bunch of extravagant shit. It's not like he has like 20 Land Rovers, Mm -hmm. but you know, um, I thought that was cool that he bought (laughs) and has it, I mean, has it in a garage. Sure. Why, why not? Um, good for you, Jake Peavy. Good for you. Um, We'll be looking out for you, Jake. Might might need some help in bass. Hey, we're happy to help, sir. And uh, that's what we do here on the Foreign Affair Podcast. We help you get through your week. Sure, why not? So for my call and cry, Wes Bradshaw, I'm over green. As always, friends, especially you guys down in Florida, stay safe and enjoy the football when you can. Good night, everybody. Good night, Porto. Remember, folks, if you have a friend who's a Porto fan, speak softly. They, they got let them, just let them run. You're listening to NGSC Sports Radio. Hear us live on NGSCSports.com where you can get awesome analysis for all things sport. Or check out our podcasts on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, and much more. For our latest videos, head to NGSC Sports YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at NGSC Sports and like us on Facebook. NGSC Sports. 
We never stop. Attention, fantasy baseball fans. Come to the next level and experience virtual Major League Baseball ownership. Our sports provides an advanced and authentic experience combining fantasy and virtual sport. By owning and operating an Our Sports franchise, you compete for championships in cash and leagues that mirror the MLB in every way. For sports fans who have dreamed of owning a sports franchise, log on to OurSportsBaseball.com or find them on Facebook as Our Sports Baseball or on Twitter at Our Sports Baseball and make that dream a reality. Reality. 